In Live on Live this Thursday, I'm delighted to welcome back to the studio Nick Norbrook, who's the managing editor of the Africa Report, for our monthly discussion on what's happening behind the scenes in African politics. And in the November edition of the Africa Report, there are two articles that really stand out, and that's what we're going to be looking at today, and that's the farmer herder wars, if you will, in northern Nigeria, and after Kabila, a look ahead at this December's elections in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Nick, as always, you're very welcome to the show. It's a pleasure. Now, let's start with Nigeria and an article entitled Clashes and Conflict that tries to clarify exactly what is the cause of the violence between Fulani herdsmen and settled farmers in the north of the country. So just give us a little synopsis. Well, I mean... The whole it's a, it's a phenomenon that's happening actually all across West Africa as desertification sort of starts to take hold in the Sahel and areas where you could graze your cattle are, are starting to disappear. So the, the green band that stretches across West Africa is narrowing and as the desert pushes towards the sea, so too the herders are pushed. Uh, and this is a phenomenon that's been happening for thousands of years, sure. but it's become a lot more acute now, partly because of population growth, partly because of this, this climate change, and partly because it's instrumentalized by political groups. Um, and so the, the, the farmers uh, in this tale, as it were, uh, are people who, you know, in the last few years, Nigeria's done quite good work in, in getting people into agriculture mm. after years and years of the economy being addicted to oil. You know, they, they, are, they have done good work in getting people into rice and other crops. Um, but it's very hard to, to convince people to go into agriculture when, uh, you know, a uh, hundred cattle will come and, and totally destroy your field. These, these are getting very violent. And actually, one of the, the, the really worrying things is uh, these clashes have claimed more lives mm. in the last 12 months than Boko Haram. Well, this is it. It's 1,300 at least that have been killed in this year alone. And I mean, that's a really, really like a, a, a quite an unbelievable figure. Uh, but the, the, also the article underlines um, what appears, you know, how we report on it from afar or how, um, you know, journalists in Europe or elsewhere, not actually on the ground, they report on it. They always, they always mention, oh, the, the mainly Muslim Fulani or the Christian, mainly Christian farmers and all that. But there's more to this than just a sectarian, than a sectarian divide. Uh, it goes deeper than this. And you, I think you kind of uh, touched on it there. You have got opportunists who are really trying to exploit these divides and these divisions for political gain as well. That's it. And, it. and it does map all too neatly onto uh, this poorly stitched together country that the UK invented ex nihilo during its colonial adventures. Um, and, and so, yes, you, you're right, you have this, you know, supposedly Christian South farmers and, and Muslim North herders. Um, and, you know, and to a large extent, the, the numbers do bear that out, although not completely. But what, you know, what people forget is that there is a lot of violence uh, from northern, uh, you know, on in northern groups, but on another northern group, as it were. It's not just sure. uh, all one way. Yes, it's not all one way. And there is indeed a, a kind of a, a common narrative that is coming out uh, with people who were interviewed in this article about the identity politics being exploited by agitators ahead of next February's elections that are due in Nigeria. So, I mean, this is really a big issue. But let's, beyond that... Uh, it's it's a it's a massive problem. It, uh, like hundreds of almost well thousands, thirteen hundred at least killed in, in the last year. Um, but some solutions are offered there in this article, such as loans for ranches. Um, and there's a, this people who are trying to break the mold of the pastoralists' ideal, saying, "Well, look, after time, when they see that they get more beef or more milk and more healthy animals, they will join." So, what actually is being put in place for this to maybe potentially work? Right now, it is um, sadly more of an idea than a concrete reality, although there are now plans being sketched up. Whether the money is being released is, a, is another matter. But the idea would be rather than uh, herders moving around, always looking for pasture, as they've done for centuries, um, you would provide them with feedlots, you would provide them with enclosures, much like the cowboys of the, of the far west in America. And, you know, they would have centralized water, food, and, and, you know, they would start milking them. They would start bulking up because these cattle, they walk hundreds of kilometers 
And as a result, they don't have babies. Mm. The meat is very tough. They're very lean. If they all were to stay in one place, then actually the herders would start making a lot of money. And that is starting to get traction. And also there was a suggestion of, um, like with, with, let's just say, the grasslands further down south towards the coast, of actually just moving the fodder up via rail link to these lands to actually put that in place. But what's the rail uh, network like in Nigeria these days? Is it a, is it a reliable uh, <laughs> mode of transport? I'm, I don't want to sound pejorative, but I mean, no, well, is, I, it, is, it, is it, would it be feasible? It was non-existent 10 years ago in mm. terms of the connection between Kano and Lagos. That's changed. They have now a service which does run up the length of the country. It's very slow. It doesn't carry much freight. Um, and for the amount of pasture that would need to be transported, I'm I'm not convinced it's feasible in the in the short run, but yeah, that that would ac- absolutely be be part of the solution. And you touched on it there, and there's a nice little sub article in the in, in this uh, piece on the the kind of well the, the 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 wars, if you will, between pastoralists and um, farmers up there, and that is the look to uh, to let's say that Nollywood should really look into making movies about what's happening up there, a la. American Westerns to better explain the actual background to what is happening up there, because I just see it here online that there, according to the African Union, there are 280 million pastoralists in Africa. That is a phenomenal figure. It is. It really is. It is. And and if you were to look into some of the conflicts in Mali and the way in which um, herding populations have been disconnected from state services, Mm. a lot of the conflict in Mali came from those problems. If you look at uh, what's going on in the drying parts of Kenya and Tukana, mm. you're having the same problems there as well. All, all across the Sahel Belt, this is incredibly relevant. And it's also, uh, uh, you know, th- this area, there, there's you know more and more children, there's less and less work, more and more prey for, you know, extremist, extremist. ideologies. Uh, it, this does need some joined up thinking from a continental body. Okay, Nick, we're going to leave that there. I think we've covered it well. It's a fantastic article uh, there called Clashes and Conflicts. But moving now to the DRC and in the frontline section of this November's Africa report, we have a 10-page explainer on the upcoming elections in the DRC. And indeed, a complex issue that warrants those 10 pages, which thankfully have been padded out with maps and graphics to get a handle on the actual situation there. But... The main thing is, this is history in the making, with Joseph Kabila being the first president to leave office without, I quote, a coup d'etat, a rebellion or an assassin's bullet. But it starts with the choice of the PPRD candidate, Emmanuel Ramazani Chandri, who is the Dauphin. Yes, and um, very much Kabila's man. Uh, He doesn't have much link with the outside partners, be they Western or Chinese, and they're really the two big players Mm. in terms of outside partners in in Congo, um, which I presume was a a deliberate choice by Kabila, who wants really to be in control of him. Now, there are some optimists who say, oh, it might be like uh, Lauren Chao in in Angola, you know, who supposedly was the dauphin um, or puppet of uh, of Dos Santos, Dos Santos yeah. but actually turns out to be quite a tough-headed reformer. And he's been going after the Dos Santos family as well. So, so I mean, I, I imagine Kabila has seen this and and, and has acted accordingly. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, there, there are such big stakes at play in Congo. We really wanted to try and and explain it as best as we could because it's it's a country which is the size of Western Europe. It has, you know, some of the big strategic minerals, not just of the last century with, you know, copper and, and oil, but also of the next century with cobalt, which is so strategic when it comes to the the, the electric economy, as it were. The, electric batteries, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. And the Chinese have 60% of that uh, cobalt production in, in their pocket, don't they? I mean, that's a huge amount. They have. Mm. Um, they cornered the market, basically. Yeah, they absolutely have. In fact, we, we, we quote the governor of... Um, of Luar Laba province, who 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 was speaking at a, a conference in in June and said everything has become Chinese. They they really have um, got a, a very dominant position in mining, obviously, but also in construction. Um, very small Chinese companies, very big state ch- uh, state Chinese companies. It's it's really the whole the whole gamut there. It's a, a very big engagement. But what about the opposition? I mean, you were speaking in the article. Uh, you spoke to the opposition leader Moise Katumbi, who has been barred from running. I mean, has the opposition really got its act together? I mean, m- more uh, let's just say under the umbrella of maybe uh, Felix Chisekedi. Well, a lot of people are disappointed by 
the lack of his organization. He's not been traveling around the country. He's not been doing big rallies. He's not been doing all the things that you might expect an opposition leader would do if he was you know, actively trying to win an election. Um, there are other opposition leaders who, it is said, have been bought by Kabila. This is not a new game in Central Africa. Mm. Uh, Paul Beer in neighboring, well, in Cameroon, ha has obviously bought a lot of the opposition to, to him. That's how he stayed in power for so long. Who knows about Chisikedi? Given who his father was, you know, a historic opposition leader, one would, would hope not. Um, but there is a sense that even the Moïse Ketumbis and uh, the Jean-Pierre Bembers, yeah. also an, another person who was, who was barred, it, it, it does seem the opposition is not really getting its act together. It needs to gain traction yet. And of course, in uh, that article, there's a, there's a very look at the contrast between a fresh-faced 29-year-old President Kabila from 2001 uh, as compared to, uh, well, this 47-year-old man today who's becoming more and more look, looks like uh, John Garang from the SPLA. He really Indeed. has got, got that uh, look in uh, place. Well, that's all we have time for today. My thanks there to Nick Norbrook from the Africa Report. Thanks. Thanks.